Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to church. I have a couple of announcements to upload your hearing. Next Sunday, June 13th, we're going to have a children's service. So all the children are currently uh, coordinatedly invited to the children's service next Sunday. And one other announcement is the First Congregation Church donated 300 pounds of food to the food pantry. And we say thank you to John Barr for all of his help and his contribution to the food pantry. Thank you very much, Frank. I will piggyback his announcement about next Sunday. We will be having a children's scavenger hunt on the church grounds immediately following the worship service and there will be light refreshments for the kids but no lunch immediately following. So look forward to Children's Sunday next week. Would you join me for a moment of prayer? Dearest Lord, we love you so much. We exalt your majesty. We thank you for this beautiful time of year that you have blessed us with. Lord, for each person here on their individual pilgrimage, may, may the knowledge of your presence engulf their lives in the week ahead. And Lord, help all of us in moments of fear, fatigue, frustration, to look up to you and know that you care and you are real. May all the parts of our worship this morning exalt you as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We ask this in your holy and sacred name. Amen. To know the warmth of love. To be confident of our work. To be washed over with grace. We are here to exalt the reality of the loving and eternal Heavenly Lord. And let us worship our God. Our opening hymn is hymn number 366 in the red hymnal. God of grace, God of glory. Let's stand and sing together the first, second, fourth, and fifth verses. Hymn 366.
Eternal God, in the reading of the scripture, may your word be heard. In the meditation of our hearts, may your word be known. And in the faithfulness of our lives, may your word be shown. Amen. You may be seated. Reading from Paul's first letter to Timothy, chapter 1, beginning with verse 12. I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service. Though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent opponent, but I received mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Would you please stand for the glory of Hotchman? to communion. So today I ask that you turn your hearts, your minds, and your souls to Jesus and his enormous sacrifice in giving his life for us. The song says, Jesus is here in this room. Whether you're in the sanctuary today, in your home, in your car, listening wherever you may be, Jesus is here in this room. Each time I say the, the word Jesus, we're going to clap. Thank you. 
As we come to our offertory portion of our service, as always, thank you for your generosity, your support, as we try to find the vision that God has for us each day that we serve our community, our state, our nation, and our world as a church. Would you please stand for the doxology? church's life each and every week. We love you and we, we seek with all of our heart and all of our strength as a congregation the directions and the vision that you have for us to make this community and our world a better place through your love and your grace. We ask this in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Let us turn to our prayer of confession and the assurance of pardon. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is the of those who fear As far as the east is from the west, so far as the our communion hymn is hymn number 288 in the red hymnal. Let us break bread together. Hymn 288 in the red hymnal. Thank you. 
morning of his betrayal and the desertion of those who were close to him, Jesus took the bread and gave thanks. And then he broke it. And gave it to his disciples, saying, This is my body that is broken for you. Every time you do this, do this in remembrance of me. The bread of life. Take this and remember. In the same way, Jesus also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. The cup of wholeness, the cup of life, poured out for you and for me. The cup of joy, the cup of salvation. Take and drink. Drink in remembrance of Jesus. Let us now have a prayer of thanksgiving. Loving and merciful God, we give you thanks that again you have refreshed us at your table by granting us the very presence of Christ. Strengthen our faith, increase our love for one another, and send us forth into the world, in courage and in peace, rejoicing in the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Our sermonic hymn is Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound. Hymn number 547 in the Black Hymn, verses 1 through 3. Let's stand and sing together, Amazing Grace, 547 in the Black Hymn. on the highest peaks around the planet is probably limited. Yes, I rode a gondola in the house. 
But my mountain climbing probably has reached an apex level in the Appalachians. However, I have always loved, I've always enjoyed reading about the exploits of mountain climbers. I've always enjoyed the history, the risk, the danger involved. One thing that I find fascinating for mountain climbers of faith and for those whose life philosophy might be more secular, there is a common thing that I have found in a number of interviews over the years with some of the greatest climbers in the history of mountaineering. They talk about their equipment. Of course, they talk about their great support teams, understanding the weather. But in interview after interview, I find the word grace that shows up. Not luck, not circumstance, grace brought them through some of the most harrowing storms, holes, crevices, dangers. Grace. That moment of protection, that moment of giftedness that we didn't do anything to get. And more times than not, maybe we shouldn't have received it. And all throughout the scriptures, the balance of the law and grace is ever present, particularly in the New Testament. So this high mountain of grace, I'm going to make this a two-week journey for us climbing up together. This week, we're going to spend a little bit of time on the law versus grace, and then talk about three primary features of grace. I'm probably going to get to the finish line on the second one, and then next week, we're going to talk about the hope that grace gives our lives in all situations. I love these old, there's so many old and wonderful quotes about the law versus the gospel of grace. I love this one from a Presbyterian minister in Scotland named Ralph Erskine, and he was in prison for field preaching, and he was very famous for gospel poems. His version of the law versus the gospel of grace goes something like this. A rigid matter was the law, demanding brick, denying straw. But when with the gospel tongue it sings, it bids me fly and gives me wings. We think about Paul, who he was as Saul, what he stood for. And I'll get to that in more detail in a moment. But you think about the letters that he penned, the urgency, the priority of communicating with those that he was mentoring, those that he fellowshiped together with those who he viewed as his fellow soldiers in this battle against evil. And his message to Timothy in the first pastoral epistle started with to guard the truth that leads to life. What was that truth? The truth was this. Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And he stated that in contrast with a distortion of what the church was teaching in Ephesus about the law. Briefly, for a little bit of history, there were leaders in the church that were using the law and combining it with Gnosticism and Greek philosophy to create a new code of conduct. <laughs> Doesn't sound dissimilar to what happens even today. Sometimes, with the worst of intentions, people can take God's holy word and twist it and turn it into a moment of entrepreneurial, materialistic gain for themselves. They can also twist God's word into moments of fearful hate and discrimination and intolerance. So it was with the Ephesian church as well. They were using the ministry for their own gain, being dreadfully sloppy with scriptures and neglecting the message of Christ. Thinking about the letter itself at verse 6, 
Certain persons, by swerving from these, have wandered away into vain pursuit and discussion, desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they were saying or the things which they made confident assertions in. Now we know that the law is good, but it is not enough, even if one uses it lawfully. And Paul was a great scholar of the law in his previous life as Saul. And he wanted Timothy to know that the law was not bad in and of itself, but it wasn't enough. It wasn't written as the guide for law keepers. It was written for lawbreakers to know where they needed to point their lives. And if, if the church leaned only on the law itself, rigid, demanding, when there came moments to run, they would not have feet to travel the race. I love this quote from author and pastor Philip Yancey, thinking about the power of grace. Grace does not depend on what we have done for God, but rather what God has done for us. Ask people what they must do to get to heaven, and most reply, be good. Jesus' stories contradict that answer. All we must do is cry, help! Help. The power of grace and the power of seeking God. The law and the rigidity that it has is in contrast to the beauty of grace in the gospel. It shines with magnificent brightness. Paul moves quickly from talking about the problems of that church and moves to the beauty of the gospel. Paul talks to Timothy about the personal nature of God's grace in his life because he knew greater than anyone perhaps how magnanimous and impossible the grace was to repay and how in the world that God had sought him to be a leader in the church. In my heart and mind, I think that Paul was always filled with a sense of gratitude, humility, and thankfulness. Even in his dying hours, even day after day, week after week, month after month, in prison, Lest we forget, most of the letters of the Pauline part of the New Testament were written behind jail bars. Now, this week, we read from verses 12 to 14. Next Sunday, I'm going to be taking 15 through 17 and sort of closing the circle of hope for us. But grace gives us the power that we cannot do on our own. There is nothing that we can do. And I've said this a zillion times as a pastor. You can take the most virtuous 115-year-old person. And there might be people in the church that would say, well, that gentleman or that lady from birth up never said a crossword, never lost their temper, never had made a stake for themselves, never missed a Sunday, always was the first to volunteer. We probably know a few people like that. Not enough. The law and works aren't enough. Because what Jesus did for us, the power of grace was that he did what we could not do. This was not simply a changed life. This was not going to the gym and losing 30 pounds on the treadmill and with lifting weights. This was an exchanged life. This was a substitution for our sins. So Paul wanted Timothy and the Ephesian church to see the difference in the law and the power of grace. And there's three things that I'm going to focus on this Sunday and next Sunday. First, that grace produces gratitude. Next, that it creates a worship hemisphere in your life. And then next Sunday, we're going to focus on the hope that it gives. Now I've referenced Paul, and I want you to think for just a moment though. 
when we think about Paul's life, the gift of the grace of God, salvation, forgiveness, transformation, personalize that in your mind for a second. Think about when you reached out and Christ became part of your life, whether it was when you were a child or five minutes ago. Think about what that means in your existence and what you want that to mean for every relationship, for every business endeavor, for every day that you live. Having grace be the cloak that we put on our lives, the jacket that warms us, letting that be our armor against the flaming arrows of fear, faithlessness, rejection, pain, anxiety, sin. Because just like I talked about those folks who have lived a gloriously virtuous life, no one is sinless except Christ. So we all need this. And let's think about that starting place, that starting place of gratitude. Paul, when he reflects on the grace of God, it's a personal thing to him. He is overwhelmed with the sense of, I am wretched, I am filled with sin, yet God saved me, and now I must run the race. I must lead others, I must mentor, I must grow churches. I think about our own lives and how distracted and tired we may feel on a given day. But yet, if we live in a hemisphere of holy imagination, what I want my life to mean, serving Jesus Christ. You don't have to know the Bible from start to finish every word. You don't have to be a pastor. You have to have a willingness. You have to have a want to. You may say, well, the best I can do, Brother Scott, is bake bread. Perfect. Who can we give it to? You may say, well, I, I'm a good golfer. I'd be happy to help the children of the church learn how to play golf. Perfect. Small, small. Those tiny stones that we put on the mosaic of who we are as a church and a people of God, that's what will get people where they are. And that's what our world needs so much. Our world, I don't want to be hypocrite. It's exciting to go to restaurants, it's exciting to go out in public, but social gatherings aren't enough. Amusement parks, the ferry is open to Martha's Vineyard, not enough. Our world needs something far beyond socialization and entertainment. Our world needs the reality of grace. Because every ball game ends, every song finishes, every movie rolls to credits, every party finally locks the door as the last party goer exits. But then what happens? Then we're back in the reality of people facing hopelessness, fear, anxiety, bewilderment. All of those things are still there. But the one thing, the grace of God is powerful enough to take someone who feels like I'm the most wretched person in the world. Bravo! May I introduce you to the Apostle Paul, who used to be Saul, the persecutor of Christians, the enemy of the church, the first volunteer to go round up believers of the way. And yet, the power of grace turned him in to the father of the New Testament church. Because you see, I believe that when Paul expresses gratitude for grace, he's also saying, thank you for paying for what I could never pay for. Somebody shared a wonderful, simple, but a powerful illustration of grace with me this week. 
And for all of us who have children or grandchildren or nieces or nephews, we probably can relate to this. A group of boys were in a baseball field throwing the ball back and forth over the fence. There were some very nice cars that were parked nearby. The mom stopped by before she went to work and said, your dad is home, don't leave from here, and whatever you do, don't throw the ball too high towards the car. Yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am. We all know what happened. 1001, 1002, ball, windows broken, hits one of the cars. Here's what's great about this story, though. The little boy that broke the window goes back to his house, tells his dad what's done, and they said, okay, I know who that car belongs to, we need to go talk to him. They go knock on the door and apologize. The man doesn't get mad. The man says, thank you for letting me know. And then the father says, we can exchange insurance cards or I can pay you. And he says, no, I should have known better than parking my car so close, close to the ball field today. I'll pay for this. As the father and the son walk back to their house, the father said, do you understand what just happened, son? And he said, yeah, I did a bad thing. And he said, no, 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 no. The power of grace just paid a debt that you could not pay. No matter how self-important we feel, no matter how holy or virtuous we may feel when we look at the plights of other people, we always need to remember that we have nothing without the grace of God. And we should be driven. We should be so, so impassioned with letting people know that they matter. With letting people know that the grace and the good news of Jesus Christ is something that takes our life to a cruising altitude of magnificent, sustained appreciation for what God did for us in giving His Son, Jesus Christ. That's the gratitude that changes lives. Because you see, when we can step outside of our cynicism, our fatigue, and our negativity, and we greet people with, Man, this is a fantastic day. I cannot believe what God is doing in my life. It takes people back. And we can't be scared that people are going to think that we're some zealots or a cult because we talk openly about the grace of God and what it means to our lives. Even if it's just equating that to who you are as a business professional, who you are as a grandparent or a parent, who you are as a friend. God is in all of it or none of this matters. And as I've shared with you before, for 52 years, well, the knee-high stuff, I'll just take as an assumption. But for as long as I've been a person of faith, everything that I say is not a Winnie the Pooh or a Dr. Seuss moment. This is real. And this is the only hope that our planet has to sustain and find peace and find equity and to find tolerance like never before. So grace produces gratitude, and that gratitude needs to be our life hemisphere. Quickly, I want to talk about how it brings us to a place of worship. Going back to Paul, because lest we forget, when God spoke to the church leaders and said, you know, please receive Paul, and you need to mentor him and care for him, their first response was, Saul? He was coming to arrest us, and you want us to, to care for him and instruct him and bring him back to health. But God spoke, and they did it. Why I think Paul was able to write so joyously and to make such a difference in the life of the churches and continue to plant churches behind bars is because he was worshipful. He worshipped the God of grace in jail. He worshipped the God of grace when he was beaten. He worshipped the God of grace 
when his life was nearing the end. We live in a time where the standard operating is complain, be negative, speak with a loud voice about how awful things are. Now sometimes we have to speak out against injustice. But there seems to be a whole lot more comfort zone establishment of complaining and being negative and being biting and being cynical than I ever recall. And I know many of the things that are said in public forum and even as common conversation went back in the day, I think my mama and papa probably would have gotten a bar of zest soap and said, okay, Scott, you want a bathroom. You're washing your mouth out. We don't talk like that. We don't act like that. And here's my point with where I'm going with this. The gift of grace is so enormous and powerful, it ought to get us to a hemisphere where the air that we breathe feels holy, where the air that we breathe feels positive. Not saying every day is going to be perfect. Deeper's nose. When I came back out to a parking lot a few days ago and, I, and somebody had, it looked like, it looked like Burt Reynolds driving the Trans Am from Smokey and the Bandit had stuck it in reverse and floored it to 110 and just plowed into the side of our van. Annihilated our front tire and the front end was so knocked out of line. And we were walking into handicaps line. So, when I first saw that, I have to be honest, my worship thermometer probably either went, started trending down or went way up. But then I tried to breathe. And then I tried to remember who was looking at me, my enemies, my enemies. And so we prayed and we talked and we made sure the car was still driving and we made it home safely. I don't say that pat myself on the back because I say that that I'm glad God grabbed me and reminded me that it matters when we lose our temper. It matters when we say crass and negative things about other human beings. It matters when we start living shades of intolerance, discrimination, and disrespect. Why? Those are not the colors of worship. And those are not the colors of grace. And you may say, well, these, 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 these historical stories of Paul are ridiculous. Who can be so joyful and have such an impact behind bars? We either believe it or we don't. And here's the thing. If God could use an enemy of the church and put him behind bars and still found church after church after church. Why not us? Why can we not be the warriors of grace today in 2021? That's what we want for our church. That's what we want as people of faith. And going to the letter to the Galatian church, Here's what Paul said. For you have heard of my former life, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing beyond my own age among my people in Judaism. So extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers. But when he who had set me apart before I was born and who called me in his grace, was pleased to reveal his son to me. Then I knew it was done in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles. Here's my message to bring it full circle before we pray. All of you have that potential, all of us, to take a Pauline journey, a pilgrimage of planting seeds, all of us do. And you may say, well, I'm retired, Scott. Okay, fantastic. I work three jobs. 
Totally understand. But we've got to have that sense of urgency and that sense of exploration to say, how is God going to use me to storytell and to put bricks on the house of grace that we want to build as a church? If we can have that determination, that enthusiasm, that willingness, the sky's the limit. And the sky's the limit, not because people are getting better. The sky's the limit because we have been given the gift of salvation and service from a God who gave his best, his son, for us. I love how Pope Francis articulated this. Let me quote. Tonight, St. Paul tells us, the grace of God has appeared. Nothing is more precious than this. To us, a son is given. The Father did not give us something. He gave us his only begotten son, who is all his graceful joy. Here's my goal as I move us towards prayer. I've shared with you before how much my family means to me, and that's those present and those who are all around the country. I'm trying to say, God, help me to go before you and find the vision of how you can better use us. The same holds true for our church. What I pray weekly during our time of offering has meaning to it. I want very much for the dollars that come in to have feet and wings and make a difference to people that are hurting and blind and lost and walking in darkness. Here's the thing. Next week we're going to talk about the hope that grace brings our life. Because here's the reality. Whether it's our health whether it's something we can't let go of, whether it's our finances, whether it's those that we hold on to perhaps too tightly. We've got to be willing to say, I believe that there is hope if I let go. And I believe that God cares because he gave the greatest gift he could give, his son, the gift of grace for our lives. And if we can do that, I think that we will find freedom for our lives beyond circles that we just can't get away from or off of, of anger, disappointment, resentment, fear, and sin. That's what grace can do for all of us. At this time, let's move to a point of prayer. Are there prayer requests or joys that want to be shared with the congregation right now? Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. I have a prayer of gratitude today. Um, if my husband had lived in the Virgin Mary in 46 um, years on this very day. Well, you know that we love you and you are very much in our thoughts today. And I'm, and I'm glad your family and your friends are with you today. It means a lot. Yes? The joy and sorrow is as we walk in the world today. We find the joy and the way that we want to be strong in our church. And actually, I would like to be the way that I've volunteered. Thank you very much, Mark. That's that's excellent point. Any others? Let us turn our hearts to the Lord in prayer. Dearest Lord, we are so humbled by your grace, the gift 
that you have given us that we can never begin to repay. But yet, the drive that should flow from all of our lives to say we are filled with joy. We are filled with a sense of disbelief, but yet certain that you have given us a gift that needs to be shared. And that the world would see how grateful we are. And they would see the reality and the power of your grace in our lives. Lord, for the prayer request that has been mentioned, we ask that your hand would be with each specific situation. For all of those who are recovering from illness or surgery, we continue to pray for your hand of healing. We do not forget the rest of our world. As our state and much of our nation is entering a new dynamic of greater health and greater sense of opening with businesses and events, there are still places around our planet that are losing the battle. And we just pray that your hand of healing would be in each country, in each corner of our planet. And we also continue to pray for those brave men and women who are on the front lines of medical science and medical service, both in hospitals, doctor's offices, and EMTs around our country and the world. Lord, continue to be with our church, and thank you for those who are gathered today celebrating the reality of who you are as our Lord and Savior. And let us pray now as your son taught us so long ago, praying to our Father, who art in heaven, come and be thy name. Thy Closing hymn is hymn number 319 in the Black Hymnal. Wonderful words of life. Let's stand and sing together. 319 in the Black Hymnal.
claim standing for a benediction. May the Lord of love bless and keep you in the week ahead. May each of your steps be filled with the certainty of God's grace for your life. We love you. We pray this in the holy name of Christ. Amen.